are these people? So as I said earlier, uh, I didn't want, I, I dreaded this week, well, this month and next month. Uh, I didn't want to talk about October 7th at all. I just wanted to avoid it. And if anything, I, we almost didn't stream tonight, we, especially with Reef, with his computer issues. I figured, you know what? It's probably divine providence that we didn't, like, we may not stream. Uh, again, shout out to Indy for being willing, stepping up and being like, no, I definitely will help out tonight. Uh, so thank you, Indy, for that. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess from that, I think, uh, I found this article from Consortium News that was written by Patrick Lawrence, um, who titles it simply Powerlessness. And I think, I think this kind of summarizes how I feel currently in terms of our political climate and... I think especially given what's happening in Gaza uh, right now, um, I, and I'm sure a lot of you feel like, feeling like we've done as much as we could and what else can be done in order to try and bring the change, not only for the Palestinians and the liberation that they seek, but the change that we want to see uh, for ourselves. So I... I think this article does a very good job of summarizing the emotions I'm sure a lot of you, myself included, have been feeling uh, for the last year in particular. So I felt, yeah, I think, I think it's a good way to kind of think about and reflect on the year, whether we want to or not, and just realize that we have to continue fighting because regardless of who's going to be president, we know that this issue in Gaza and the West Bank is still ongoing. And, you know, we, in whatever way, we need to do our part to help these people and ultimately help ourselves um, to seek true liberation in the region and in the world right now. So let's get into it. Um, so... By the way, America's consortium, I want yeah. to say consortium news, indie media award honoree. I also have been feeling, you know, of course, the burnout. And that's why I didn't, first of all, with Colin bringing two stories, I didn't also want to bring stories about October 7th. But there, let me tell you, Mondo Weiss did a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous coverage. Uh, you should definitely go check out Mondo Weiss. They, did, they do a daily, now it's a, a weekly thing about about uh, what's happening in Gaza, as well as Mint Press did a tr did an incredible weekly special uh, and, and year end special. So by all means, check out those two as well as what we're going to talk about tonight with with, with Consortium. Um, but I wanted to before you got started, I wanted to mention that yeah. there's a bunch of different outlets that have done extensive coverage, not just this week but all year round, and that we should be supporting those independent outlets. So. Right. By all means. Um, okay. So if you go back to the first slide uh, in the I'll start there. Um, so again, simply titled Powerlessness. America's political elites are not powerless to restrain the rogue Israeli regime. They are powerless to act against the grotesque lobby led by but not limited to APAC to which they have sold themselves. So mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. continue. Mm -hmm. Um. Let us begin with the cold, some facts of the cold, hard kind concerning conditions in Gaza and the West Bank after a year of terrorist Israel's daily assaults on the Palestinian occupations, populations in both places. These statistics derived from a World Bank report issued this month, impacts of the conflict in the Middle East on the Palestinian ec economy. They cover conditions through March. We can confidently conclude things have gone since Worsen. Oh, worsen. Yeah. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to play it from here. 11 months into the conflict in the Middle East, the Palestinian territories are nearing economic freefall amidst a historic humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip, the report begins. 
Official data reveals a 35% decline in real GDP in the first quarter of 2024 for the Palestinian territories overall, marking its largest economic contraction on record. The conflict has brought Gaza's economy to the brink of total collapse with a staggering 86% contraction in the qu first quarter of 2024. In Gaza, 1.9 million people have been displaced, and more or less everyone now lives in poverty, the bank reports. We already know about the hospital bombings and the murders of administrators, doctors, and nurses, which we have covered on this show. Now we learn that 80% of primary care centers no longer function. Up to 70% of farmland has been damaged or destroyed, pushing nearly 2 million people to the edge of widespread famine. The education system has collapsed. All 625,000 school-aged children of Gaza have been out of school since October 7th, 2023, the World Bank says. As most Palestinians well and grimly understand, the Israelis intend to make the West Bank another Gaza and are simply attempting to attract less attention as they do so. The West Bank economy contracted by only, quote-unquote, 25% in this year's first quarter. The bank puts an unemployment at 35%, primarily because post-October 7 checkpoints and roadblocks make getting to work difficult, if not impossible, and because Palestinians are now barred from cuning to jobs in Israel. Bezel Smolrich. Wait, wait, you have you have to you have to make like some kind of a sound when you say Bezel Smolrich. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. The Netanyahu regime's fanatical finance minister has taken to withholding tax funds Israel collects on the Palestinian authorities' behalf, sending the West Bank into a deficit the bank predicts will come to nearly two billion dollars this year. What has any one of us been able to do to stop the rampage that has produced these conditions? This is my question. Wow. Gilles Paris, I get, well, I get assuming that's French. He is French. A long pronounced it in a French way. A longtime reporter and now columnist at Le Monde, consider the realities facing Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank in a commentary published this week under the headline, the losers of the Gaza war are those whose powerlessness has become de facto acceptance. Apart from all the World Bank stats, he also notes a UN environmental environment program study published in June that concludes the Palestinians of Gaza now live under or top 39 billion metric tons of rubble. Million. And will need at least million metric tons of rubble, and will lead at least a decade to dig out of it. Oh, my God. A decade. But that's, of course, we know that the, the plan for what, you know, what Israel has planned for there. It may, it, they, they won't need a decade to dig out of it, but the, yes, if we, it, at, at the rate, there, and by the way, J. Paris for Le Monde, you think he might be from, from in France? I, I think he might be. <laughs> well, I'm just, well, you could say the French way, or could say the yes. American way. Yeah. So, um, anyway, the Guise Paris piece caught my eye because the state of powerlessness has been much on my mind since Israel began its genocide on October 8th, 2023. There is yes. no question Israel's inhumane conduct towards the Palestinian people has revealed, in rip off the veil of passion, the impotence of many people and constituencies. But which people, which constituencies, and what can be done about it? Let us take care to consider these questions scrupulously. As Gilles Paris sees it, the powerless losers in the current West Asia crisis are the American leadership. He names President Joe Biden, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, and CIA Director William Burns, along with the European powers and the Arab regimes that signed the Arab Accords four years ago, hoping to normalize with the Zionist state. Okay. They've all suffered damaged images and reputations not succeeded in stopping the Israelis' atrocities. They have all suffered humiliation upon their humiliation, as Perry puts it. But he takes too much at face value, it seems to me, and, makes so, make, and so makes a critical error a judgment. It is true that Benjamin Netanyahu has emerged this past year as an out-of-control sociopath, and I'm going by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the Godel DSM. He is aggressive, given to violence, isolated, driven by irrational compulsions, indifferent to others, utterly lacking in empathy. 
If you study his face, you detect the features of a crazed, manically possessed man. He has acted since the events of October 7th with near total impunity. Yes. But the thought that Biden and his people proved incapable of preventing the disaster, as Giles Perry puts it, is a preposterous fiction. I would have thought a journalist of his standing could see as such. The collective Biden, a wonderful term the Russians have used since the president's mental infirmities, make it impossible to tell who's running the show, never had any intention of stopping the Israelis. All paying attention people know this. As Brett Murphy at ProPublica reported this week, when two State Department reports concluded in the spring that Israel was blocking humanitarian aid from Gaza, Lincoln went to Congress to testify, we do not currently assess that the Israeli government is prohibiting or otherwise restricting the transport or delivery of U.S. humanitarian assistance, which we now know mm -hmm. is, is a lie. Sure. Um, and really, he should be arrested right now. But he, 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 we know he was able to say it because he knew that nothing was going to happen to him or to Israel. So the two official findings from the Agency for International Development and the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Immigration should have required the Biden regime to freeze nearly $830 million in weapons aid to Israel. Lincoln dumped his own people out on the limo. Is this a man or an administration trying and failing to prevent Israel's campaign of terror? No. It is true. As well, well, it is he's, true. He's not trying and failing. He's just not trying. So, right. no. <laughs> It is true, as Jeez Parry asserts, that the collective Biden has proved powerless to even accentuate Netanyahu's madness, just as the Biden White House, whoever is making its decisions, will not moderate it now as Israeli aggression accelerates in the West Bank and lately against Lebanon. But it is vitally important to get this question out of, of powerlessness right if we are to understand our predicament. America's political elites are not powerless to restrain the rogue Israeli regime. They are powerless to act against a grotesque lobby, led by but not limited to the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, to which they have sold themselves. In late September, the Israelis opened in Lebanon another theater in what Yenyahu describes as the Seventh Front War he plans. As that was happening, Middle East I quoted Amichai Chikli, Israel's Minister for Disaster Affairs, calling for the occupation of southern Lebanon on the argument that Beirut has failed to exercise its sovereignty. That's insane! That's insane! Okay, they're just calling to steal Lebanon? They're, well, they haven't exercised their sovereignty, so we're just going to take it. Right. What? There's, there's no sign the Biden regime will raise any objection as Israel aggresses in Lebanon, another of his wanton provocations. We must now consider whether the Jewish state's near total impunity, as it has appeared to date, is in fact limitless impunity, impunity without end. Once we grasp the extent to which the executive and legislative branches in Washington have sold U.S. policy to APAC and other influence-mongering groups serving in the Zionist state's behalf, we are face to face with powerlessness as it is. The true powerlessness is ours. This is what we have to think about. From the column fed appended to a random selected column, the war party makes its plans, published in a space and reproduced in Consortium News, I choose the remarks of a few readers representative of various shared views. So this was from Lois Gannon, who wrote this on September 20th. At what point do the people of the U.S. and its colonies decide they've had enough of this insane brinkmanship and call for a national strike until these lunatics step back, concede defeat, call for immediate ceasefire and negotiations? Nothing else is acceptable. They are terrorizing the whole of humanity to further their imperialist agenda that only benefits a tiny oligarchy. Yeah. From Steve, September 21st, in response to Lois, never. FOMO is real. Fear of missing out on that next promotion or that next invite to a cool kids party or, or of being ostracized by people you thought were your friends has paralyzed Western society. Just look at what has happened with families and friends freezing out members because of political elite beliefs since 2016 
or because of unwillingness to take a vaccine in 2020, or because of a lack of support for war in Ukraine, or lack of support for Israel's war in Gaza. Social media has driven the world mad over the last decade. People once used to be able to put political or religious differences aside, but everything has to become a Manchian decision. You are either with me or I will cut you out of my life. From Cypher Random, September 21st. I love to think it could happen, but we are about to have an election where, just like in the last election, well over 95% of Americans will vote for candidates that support war. There's not even a hint of peace party in this country. The only thing that can be found is warmongers who tactically say that they are against a particular war, or the Obama tactic of complaining that the war is being mismanaged and that they can do better. All such anti-war candidates will, of course, give even more money to the military. But in America, a partner for peace is not anywhere in sight. When they tally the votes for this election, they will find war in about 89, 99%, and peace with maybe 1%. In an election with uncertainty about whether an even bigger war might erupt even before the computers announce a victor, that is how America is going to vote. Nobody proposes big cuts to the military for prosperity at home. A candidate pro proposing peace will get stoned by the mob. President Kennedy once gave a peace speech. One can still find it on YouTube, or at least you can, the last I looked. The mm -hmm. Dems might have classified it as Russian propaganda by now but he didn't make such a speech. JFK never got a chance to see if that might have been a popular way to run for re-election. Peace in our time, I, I, re, I, remember, I recall that very clearly. Talk about what, what, what does peace in our time look like? Maybe we should play that if we can find it. Um, this is what powerlessness sounds like in America in the early autumn of 2024, less than a month before those who will vote will choose a new president. It is by turns principled, determined, bitter, cynical, at times confusing in its thinking, nostalgic for once was, but no longer is. These three, and I quote them because there are so many like them, look at the political landscape this autumn and see no one standing for election other than honorable fringe candidates who comes even closer to representing their aspirations. I'm sure there are many different views of the Gaza crisis, Israel, and the Palestinians abroad among Americans. I am not sure how many people who still vote would choose an anti-war, anti-genocide president were one on the ballot this uh, November 5th. I'm absolutely sure that, setting aside the impossible prospect of a partner for peace, as Cypher Random would put it, Whoever is elected in a few weeks' time will take more or less no interest in the sentiments of aspirations of Americans as he or she proceeds with the business of making war. This is one of the realities of powerlessness in America. The nation's political institutions and its political process are no longer responsive to those they are supposed to serve, those who own them, indeed. The elites purporting to lead the United States and to speak and act in Americans' name have fully participated in Israel's brutalities these last 11 months, and in doing so, the vast American's morality and its very humanity, making Americans complicit, indeed, in war crimes. We have watched for nearly a year as the violence, torture, suffering, and death have proceeded. And now, as dismal reminders of our impotence, we read of the results, the fate's complice in World Bank and UN reports. I've long fought, having lost faith in the political process many years ago, that ours is a time, and there have been many such times in America's past, when people need to form genuine social and political movements while well outside this process to find their ways forward. A 60s on steroids, as a late friend from the old anti-war days once put it. Some of those readers quoted above seem to tilt in this direction. But then comes the pessimism. No, that sort of scene is not possible any longer. The New York Times ran a remarkable piece in this line, in the September 21st editions under the headline, How the Powerful Outmaneuvered the American Protest Movement. Sinep Tufik is a professor at Princeton where she claims the study of social movements as her expertise. Reviewing the preparations universities now make to preclude protests and in the effectual demonstrations at the Democratic Convention in Chicago's last month, she writes, 
protesting just doesn't get results anymore. Not the way it used to. Not in that form. It can't. And I actually agree with her. Um, I mean, I saw it with George Floyd. I was on the streets for George Floyd. And the fact that, like, and I say this all the time, the fact that I saw, quote, unquote, activists saying, Black activists saying, oh, we have to vote for Biden because Trump is just so bad. Like, and then the moment that Biden came in, everyone just kind of dusted their hands and walked away. And these are the same people that I get pissed off now just internally because these are the very people who up until maybe a few minutes ago were like complaining like, oh, Biden sucks in relation to God, and so we need to get him out. But they're still willing to vote for Kamala because... The fear of, oh, if I don't vote for Kamala, the right, our rights, quote unquote, rights are being taken away. And I should have posted this. I forgot. But I said on Twitter, look, if you're worried about your rights being taken away, then they're not rights to begin with. Like, rights are something that everyone should have. Those are the very basic things that, as a human, you should naturally have. And you know what those are. So if you're afraid of a president taking your rights away, first of all, once you have it, it's very hard to take away, if you can at all. So I would argue what we have in this country is merely privileges that the government might just decide to give to you as a crumb. But either party will be more than willing to take it away if given the proper uh, reason or slash if the right donors say they should. So that's really a non-argument for me that we have to throw the Palestinians under the bus in order to save our comfort. That's really what it is. You're trying to save your comfort. Meanwhile, Palestinians are still being killed. So George, to me, it's just, go ahead. George Carlin actually famously said, "You, we don't have rights. We have a bill of temporary privileges. That's literally like the line that he used to say. And then, and then also the same thing about like voting for Biden. There was that guy yesterday. I don't know if you watched that. That guy who was spitting fire for five and a half minutes, almost six minutes, yelling at another Palestinian. How can you say you're going to vote for for Kamala Harris for them? You're doing it for you, for your comfort, for your privilege. Okay, so that you can feel better about it. And I was like, and now you're you're just nailing it. You're, you're saying exactly that. I. I've said this to you, I think. I, well, I've said this on Twitter, and I know I've said this to you. I went to Uganda in 2019. I saw firsthand the after effects of a genocide, another genocide that the West turned their back on. Like, I went to the fucking memorial. I saw a lot of the artifacts there. I saw the graves of people that, up until this day, they still are in mourning over the death of their families over 30 years ago. Palestine may not even have that if Israel has their say. They may not even have a memorial, possibly in Gaza or in the West Bank, of all the martyrs that have passed away or been killed on account of Israel's carnage. And that's the thing I think about all the time. And that's why I, mm. I, I can't, in good conscience, vote for a person who basically admits that nothing is going to change in terms of what's happening in the region. And especially given what I have seen on the ground, it's like, it, my rights are not worth having if it means the destruction of someone else's. Like, it's either all of us have it or none. That's kind of the way that I'm at. And this is kind of why, especially in this part where uh, she says, protests don't work. I agree because oftentimes we go in with our ego in terms of, oh, we get to change the world. Oh, oh, it's a trending thing. And then, you know, like we do it for maybe a few seconds and then we don't do it anymore. So, so I agree, like protests, and I do believe that they are necessary, but they don't come off with the same like, the political elites don't care that you're protesting. They don't. Like, hell, I saw Kamala, like, I don't think I've ever said this before, but I saw Kamala basically taking a photo up, like, I was probably within 15 feet of her at the George Floyd protest, 
She took a picture just to say, oh, I was there. And then she walked away. You know, didn't talk to anybody as far as I saw. Didn't engage with anybody. She just was there just to take a picture. Probably to post it on Twitter or whatever. And then just left. And, you know, so they don't care. They really don't care. They're not fearful of you if you're protesting them. Because right now, these same people who are protesting them are willing to vote for Kamala now. So what does that tell you? Look at Medea Benjamin. She she may not she may or may not vote for Kamala, but she's certainly not going to hold the squad accountable. She's certainly not going to, and she goes hard. She protests like crazy, and does it stop anything? I mean, it's nice to see to yell at somebody, but they all know who she is. They all know what she's doing. They all know when she's there because security's been told, and they still let her in. Right. Sorry. I'm sorry to burst no, that bubble. Right. That's everybody kind of everybody that's loves her. And and it's one of these days we'll do a whole a whole deep dive uh, on her. And, I, and others have, if you really want to do some Google searches and see what's going on there. But um, you know, she she does some good things and then she does some not so good things like hugging Mehdi Hassan and saying that he's a legend in, in media. What? Okay. Or not covering for me when I was yelling at the squad at the event that I went to last year that she happened to be at. Like, absolutely. She walked out. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. All right. Uh, so, to continue her quote, and then, those in power have figured out how to outmaneuver pro outmaneuver protesters by keeping peaceful demonstrators far out of sight organizing an overwhelming police response that brings the threat of long prison sentences and circulating images of the most disruptive outliers that make the whole movement look bad. It works, and the organizers have failed to keep up. Look at the, uh, the Atlanta top city protesters and what they're doing to them. I mean, just persecution. Right. right. And, and now Israel, by the way, has arrested Jeremy Lafredo today. I don't know, you know, we're, what's going to happen with that. Gray Zone's been reporting on that, but it's it's happening here, you know, and it's scary. And a little further to Fekic's Coupe de Grasse. Hell no, we won't go. The whole world's watching. No justice, no peace. R.I.P. the era when big protest marches, civil disobedience, and campus encampments so often changed the course of history. It was a good run, wasn't it? Mm. It is a good thing Professor Tufekic is not an organizer or a leader of anything of importance, so exuberantly does she celebrate what she takes to be the end of history's triumph of power. Power, the topic from which she flinches in the predictable way of most liberals, in this case power, as repression. Mm -hmm. Tefekic's training is in computer programming. There is no evidence in this piece, none, that she has any understanding of the dynamics of dis dissonance, as I, may, as I may as well call it. Where would we be, I have to wonder, if some new university rules and more rows of police barricades were sufficient, as Tefekic seems to think, to extinguish any idea of worth, any commitment to a cause that insists, insists on itself because the time is imminent. I credit to Fekit, though, for suggesting various social factors that make the impressive movements of the past seem so distant, impossible acts to follow. Consumer capitalism is vastly more advanced than it was during the hell no days. Neoliberal orthodoxies are far more prevalent, economic insecurities much greater. The me decade, so brilliantly explicated in the late Christian latches, the culture of narcissism, came but never went. No. Ours, in short, is a different and diminished consciousness. Our dependent on technological devices has advanced a social atomization that was evident well before Apple put out its first iPhone on the market. Somewhere along the post-1960s line, people took on the idea that right-thinking social movements are not to countenance either hierarchy or authority. It is childish. Nothing gets done without both. These matters have a lot to do with what I take to be a sense of powerlessness prevalent among many of us as one violent crisis after another unfolds before our eyes, the worst of them threats to humanity itself, and no effective reply seems available. 
The sensation of powerlessness, as I've argued previously, is a primary source of depression, but it's almost always an illusion. To escape it, one need only take the next logical step after an honest appraisal of circumstances as they are. This may be an advance of a few inches or of many miles, but with it, one is in motion, one has began to act, one is still alive. So, yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of which, speaking of powerless, there's there's a song by a guy I co-host a show with named Jesse Jet. He wrote a song called Powerless, and it's it's supposed to be inspiring. That if you feel like you're just powerless, I guess you bought the lie. Because they're they're petrified of our collective might. I can I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start doing that. But if you want more of Jesse Jet and INN and INN News, by all means, like Sean the Accord Lord did when we first started this segment. Thank you so much, Sean. You can support with with a contribution because we are solely user and and viewer funded, and we deeply appreciate and need your support. Thank you so much co-fee.com slash Indie News Network. Cash app dollar sign Indie News Network as well. Yeah, like, like that says over there. Don't don't forget to, to like and click the button subscribe, right? And share. And we're going to fight that suppression. But we need to also go to rumble.com slash C slash Indie News Network and go to kick.com slash Indie News Network. Shout out to Kick. We're catching Kit. We're on our way to a million together. We're all going to do it. I promise. I promise we're all going to do it together. All right. Uh, hang on. Let me go back there so we can see that. And uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to get to 3K. Just we just we're almost at 2200 now. So thank you so much. Uh, but we're also we also just passed um, a thousand on our INN newsletter. So check out innnewsletter.com. You'll get that every day for free. Three dollars, zero dollars. But you can also support there as well. And, uh, of course, as always, thanks for watching, fam. Yeah. And shout out to, I saw you did post his donation, but shout out to, who is it? Sean. Uh, Sean. Um, for your 20 bucks, man. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Sean is, Sean is supporting INN almost single-handedly. Sean and Adam Ayers. And and several others. I mean, this this co past couple of weeks have been really really great, and appreciate that.